And by that point, like I think what was the final tipping point to me leaving that career was it was like one day, like all of a sudden, like some I was all I was fed up, but I was not going to leave. That was going to be very, very difficult for me. So it was just one day, like I think my boss said something to me and I was just like, no, nope. like there was just this thing that like crashed inside of me. It was like a I call it like a sacral screen because I'd been ignoring it for a long time. There, there'd been a lot of no's, but I was like, it was like, no. And I was like, oh. Oh, okay, yeah, we're done. Like, I was like, I think I had the next day off. Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have been such an admiring admirer of your work for a while. When I first started learning about human design, I was like, who is this person? I love the way she interprets things and the way you break down information is so clear and concise and also approachable. It's not judgy for lack of a better word. I don't feel like you're telling us like this is the right way to do things, but I'm so excited to chat with you to talk a little bit more about your book, A Modern Guide to Human Design that I have here, and just to hear about your story and your process. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm glad we were able to connect over the past, gosh, I guess it's been like maybe since the fall, since before my book came out, and I'm also a fan of your work, so <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Oh my god, thank you. You're a one three generator, you're a human design expert and also the vessel of love as your incarnation cross. And you're also the host of the podcast New Paradigm Human and the founder of Pure Generators. I have so many questions, but just to introduce you to the listeners, who are you? Who is Rachel? How would you describe yourself today? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, I think at my core, I am a creative person that likes to create things and put them out in the world. I guess my chosen area is human design, but not just human design. It's really a focus on, I focus on generators and manifesting generators. I also provide some information for all of the types. There's all the types in my book. I have some reports and things and on my blog. But my real focus is generators and manifesting generators and just helping us really live our design and do the things in the world that we want to and spend our time in the ways that we want to and our energy and align our minds with our design. So a lot of the work that I do goes toward that. But yeah, I mean, I just I'm just happy to to be on Earth and uh, getting ideas and making them reality and putting them out there. And I'm just very grateful that other people also resonate with that. And they've allowed me to, to dedicate my life to helping generators and MGs. And we need more people that are satisfied, aligned, or at least happy with their lives. And I know that sounds on the outside, a lot easier said than done. And mm -hmm. I can resonate a little bit with your story of like, being so burnt out at a place that is supposed to be good for us or, you know, supposed to do according to society and then feeling that disconnect. How was that journey, that process of your life? Yeah, I mean, I would say, and I think this is typical of a lot of generators, really just a lot of people, but I actually loved work. That was a really, that's always been a really big part of my life, having a, like a job that I enjoy or even mm -hmm. just that is, mostly satisfying somewhere to go every day put my energy towards something expand build whatever um was always like very natural to me so I didn't have terrible experiences in the career that I had previous to starting peer generators um I started peer generators almost 
five years ago. Actually, it was my my like work quitting anniversary is coming up pretty soon. I can't oh. remember the exact day, but it's very close to now. Um, but yeah, it was like a good journey. Like I actually really loved the job I did for a long time, even though it wasn't super creative. I knew I wouldn't do it forever. I knew maybe it wasn't like the best soul fit, but it was satisfying. I got a lot of really cool opportunities out of that. But basically what happened was I, for a lot of years, I was doing something that I think was a good enough match for my energy. Mm -hmm. And I was satisfied enough every day. And it gave me the funds to pursue other interests in my spare time freely. Um, But I eventually took a promotion where I was managing people. And because in a lot of corporate environments, that's your only way to get paid more to just like go up the ranks. And I very quickly realized that that was not a fit for my energy. And I was very drained and frustrated and just nothing about that was really right for me. And so I only lasted about six months doing that. And I just very quickly was like, I'm, I'm a coming ill, you know, I'm just not, uh, this is just not a fit for my energy. And so I just had this feeling like, okay, I think I need to do what I've always wanted to do, which is like go and start my own thing, even though I really had no idea what that was going to be. So it was a big leap of faith. And I did have some, like I was able to be a contractor for my previous company for a while. Like I had a little bit of a a, a launch pad, I guess, from that. Um, and I, I always like to tell people, you know, there's a lot of like glamorized stories of like, and then I quit my job and started my million dollar business. And I just don't think that's right for most people. And honestly, if I could have done it differently, I think I would have. Mm -hmm. Um, So I hope that my work (laughs) helps people like get into a better place when they want to make those transitions in their life. Um, But it did end up working out for me. And I I had some time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And I'm still here like five years later. So it's worked out okay. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it was just basically that feeling of like, I am drained, unsatisfied, feeling like just so physically, mentally, emotionally bad all the time that I was like, I I know this isn't a fit for my energy. Right. I really appreciate for sharing like how at the beginning it wasn't like draining. And like you said, it wasn't like everything sucked. It was burning no. and I had to just leap from one place <laughs> to another because so many of us find ourselves in these places where it's like, okay, there's something here, but there's also some things that don't work. If you don't mind me asking, what was, what parts of that career what what was your career before and how I'm sure that those elements also help you transition to the next chapter as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I was a project manager. Like I started as kind of like a project coordinator, junior project manager, and then went all the way to um, a senior project manager. And then basically I was managing a team of project managers and we worked in the translation industry. So it was a company that did translation for a lot of big Silicon Valley streaming companies and just like every kind of tech, big tech company you could imagine. So it was really, it was cool work. You know, you really got to see the effects of what you did out in the world. Um, And I think for me, what really worked and a lot of this, I can now explain with my human design because I did not know my human design back then. I actually did not know about human design when I quit that job. It was just something that came into my life very quickly after that. And Mm -hmm. I was able to kind of figure it out pretty quickly and realize that I could share about my experience, even if I was new to that information. But anyway, I didn't really know my design. But now looking back, I think as a 1-3 profile, I really like to work like in my own world, in my own process, figure out things on my own, try things out. So I just had a lot of independence and a lot of like alone time to do like finances and make uh, like streamlined processes and automation. And, um, you know, there was, there was some like client communication. That was always my least favorite part, but basically just like, how can we make this process the best for like everyone who's involved in doing this work? And so I think that freedom and mostly that freedom to decide what I wanted to do at times during the day, like I had certain deadlines each day that I had to hit, but the rest of the time was kind of free. And I think that really worked for me. I was able to just like respond my way through and design Mm -hmm. how I wanted to spend my time. And what shifted when I had to manage people was all my time was like all, like my whole schedule was determined for me. I had these meetings all day and I'm also a really introverted person and 
I just being around people that much, it just burnt out my nervous system. And I, I think if you have an undefined solar plexus, that's something that can really happen. So 50% of us are kind of sensitive to that. If you're not someone who is really energized by interacting with other people, that can be really taxing on your nervous system. So yeah, that was a career that I had. And uh, that's why it worked for so long, I think, was because there were just all these satisfying little tasks. And mm -hmm. I got to see the the really like the fruits of that every day. Like I had every day I had projects I closed. Like every day I worked towards some like longer term things of like making processes better. And um, so, yeah, it was just like those little bits of satisfaction that I think worked for so yeah. long. And then when you found out about being a generator, how did that hit? How did human design find you? Yeah, it was in the few weeks after I left that job that just randomly, like three people mentioned it to me. And it's possible that I had encountered it before, but, you know, we don't really take these things in until we're ready or maybe until we're, our brains are looking for something like that. Like maybe my mind wasn't really attuned to that previously. So even if I saw it, I, I don't think I saw it. So after like the third person, I was like, okay, I should probably fig like look into this. I, it was probably a response really is what it was. Mm -hmm. So I researched it a little bit. I remember like the first time I saw the chart and I was like, oh no, like this doesn't make any sense. Cause I, <laughs> I get like really overwhelmed by things like that. And I was like, this, like this chart itself tells me no info. I don't really know what to do with this. So I remember like closed it. I was like, man, not for me. And then it was like one more mention. I was like, okay, we're going back. And I, I got a book and I opened it. I think, I don't know if it was the first book, but I remember like the first moment where I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense was I ordered Ra Uruhu's book on Amazon and it arrived and I took it to a cafe and I was sitting there feeling very lost because generators, when they've had a job for a long time, then suddenly they don't have a job. It's like not a good feeling <laughs> for most of us. So I was feeling a little untethered and lost. And I remember sitting there and I read the section about generators and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. All of this makes sense. It just, it was just like all the experience I'd had make, made sense. So even though it was like new information, I was like, oh, I have something to share about this. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I, I'm just going to start talking about this. Like I have something to say because I was looking online, you know, there wasn't a ton of human design stuff on Instagram. It was a much smaller world five years ago. And I was like, no one's talking about generators. Like no one is talking about this. So I was like, well, I guess we're just going to start talking about it. So I started a blog and I just, honestly, I didn't even talk about manifesting generators. I was like, I can only talk about myself. Like I can't. And that is yeah. somewhat true to this day as like a one, three profile. It's like, I'm in my own process. So I can only talk about the parts that are like similar to me, um, like the sacral response and just, yeah, life force energy and all of that. But yeah, I just like started the blog and I was like, well, we're just going to start talking about this just based off of like personal experience. And then um, I was just like devouring the human design information, like learning it very, very quickly at that point. Yeah. And I'm sure it's like a one, three, you're also testing it like unconsciously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Things are bumping into you. Tell me a little bit about the sacral response. Cause I love hearing it from like different generators and how they feel it in their bodies. Because when we hear about life force energy, it's like, excuse me, what does that mean? <laughs> no biggie, no pressure. <laughs> how does the sacral, how does the center talk to you? Yeah, I, I think it varies for different people. I've heard a lot of different things. Obviously, I can only speak to like my actual experience of how I've felt it. And by that point, like I think what was the final tipping point to me leaving that career was it was like one day, like all of a sudden, like some I was all I was fed up, but I was not going to leave. That was going to be very, very difficult for me. So it was just one day, like, I think my boss said something to me and I was just like, nope. Like there was just this thing that like crashed inside of me. It was like a, I call it like a sacral screen because I'd been ignoring yeah. it for a long time. There, there'd been a lot of no's, but I was like, it was like, no. And I was like, oh, oh okay. Yeah, we're done. Like, I was like, yeah. I think I had the next day off. I had planned that already. And it was like a Friday. And then on Monday I gave my notice. So I was like, oh, okay. This, I have to listen to this. But for me, I think what really made a lot of sense when I read that information about generators was I was like, number one, I have so little of that 
feeling of satisfaction in my life, that feeling of like, oh, I can't wait to get up. Like, oh, I, I can't wait to do this thing. Like this thing is sparkly and exciting. And um, I just hadn't had a lot of that in the the recent past at mm-hmm. that time. And so I was able to look back at things in my life. And I was like, oh, that's why that was so easy. That's why that was so fun. Like things that I maybe done in college or a creative project, or like I had a style blog when I was unemployed after college, things like that. And I was like, oh, those were like truly energizing activities. And then I could kind of see how the stuff that I'd been doing my in my job, I was like, it's not terrible, but it's not like that level of energizing. So I was able to make sense of a lot of those feelings of responses and what that feels like by looking toward the past. There's mm-hmm. certain things in my design that definitely like point to that. Um, so it may not be that way for everybody, but you basically just feel an expansion, like mm-hmm. a like you're moved forward. Um, you know, some people may hear like, the, you know, the traditional line about the sacral is like, it's like an uh-huh or uh-uh sound but of course the person who is who was teaching human design Ra Uruhu, he himself was not a generator so you know he can only describe that to the the level that he has heard from other people so yeah I, I always just describe it people as like do you feel that like sort of ooh, like I'm being pulled down we generators make a lot and NMGs make a lot of noises like eek like, yeah, uh, yeah, little like, grunts here and there. <laughs> yeah, and later I thought about it too. I had f- friends in college, in particular, just people that I spent a lot of time with. I lived with, like, knew me really well. And I remember I was like, I took a year off in the middle, and I came back, and they were like, "Oh my god, I'm so glad you're back! Like, we missed all your little like uh, noises." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> that was your sacral language <laughs> so I guess I've just been going around for a long time like well this happens oh, like this happens yes. so everyone has their own noises so if you're wondering you can ask the people around you if you've ever made these noises yes yes oh my gosh <laughs> I definitely watch like my husband his family like the siblings around them they're all sacrals all of them seem to be three five like the three of them out of four. And the way they communicate is through grunts. It's like, mm, huh, mm. I'm like, what is <laughs> happening here? Like, you know, men a few words, but it's all grunts. And like seeing that they're generators, oh, it kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're grunty, grunty people. <laughs> grunty, very expressive, like more expressive than like the traditional, maybe it was like face and all that, but like your body will tell you if you want something or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you'll also hear like, if you listen to an interview or something, you'll hear me do it a lot of like, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like that's kind of a, a generator's empty yeah, sound for sure. The response to humming. <laughs> yeah. After, you know, all your experimentation and all the research you've done, like what are some contradicting information you found about generators? Because one of the things I've heard is like, they never burn out or they're here to Mm -hmm. be the worker bees of the world. And every time I hear it, I'm like, this doesn't, I don't think it's worded right. (laughs) I understand the intent. Like what are some of the things you found that are not really true to you? Yeah, I definitely think those are like the first few that come to mind. You know, there is a lot of stuff out there like, oh, the worker bee. And I think for a lot of us, it's so much more nuanced and we like we've had bad experiences with that because it's pretty common for generators or MGs, we can get things done and people can feel that. And so it's easy to maybe get taken advantage of with that or people just take for granted that you can get it done or that you can do anything. But for us, even though we might have the energy to do those things, we're very aware of whether it's something that we want to do or not. I mean, maybe sometimes we're not aware, but once you become aware, it becomes very clear and you start to realize, and this is kind of true of like any defined energy in your chart, that the plus of having defined energy is that you have consistent access to it. The challenging thing about that is that you don't have control over it. It has its own agenda kind of. So that is very true of the sacral energy that you have to really learn to surrender to that. It's not just like you can wake up and put it toward what you need to. And I think, and that is somewhat true for non-sacral people 
reflectors, projectors, manifestors, they're not going to have that energy every day. But when they get some of it from somewhere else in the world, they can kind of just say like, okay, well, I'm going to put that towards this. They can kind of mentally choose like, well, this is what I'm doing. This is, you know, whatever decision they've made through their um, inner authority or you know, outer authority, whatever, their authority. Um, and then it's easier to just be like, okay, well, I'm putting that towards this. And then what's more important for them is just making sure that they're not burning out their bodies and they're stopping when they need to, and they're getting enough rest, things like that. But for generators and MGs, it's like, if the energy isn't there for that, it really affects you to put it toward that direction. So that's where we'll burn out. It's not so much like doing too much or exhausting ourselves, although that can cause burnout, but we're much like we're much more likely for that to happen if it's something that we don't enjoy. If we enjoy it, we can keep going. Mm -hmm. But I guess, and yeah, to your other point with the burnout, we definitely do need rest. Like, I think that that's also, it, it, it's confusing because they say like, the more you're doing things you love, like you need to know, like you, the more energy you get, but it's like, we're still humans. We have to go to sleep. So, I mean, I have had, I definitely have had the experience of you, you find this new thing, you're so into it and you just want to do it and you stay up till 4am. Mm -hmm. And that may happen once in a while, like that i that definitely happens to me, but that's not really sustainable. And so it's this interesting balance of you're so energized by it, but in the same way, you kind of have to surrender to that energy and let it go where it wants to. There's a point each day where it's like, I'm done. Like it's, it's done. And that's when you really have to listen and go and get that sleep because mm -hmm. that's what's going to, or rest. That's, what's going to really replenish you for the next day of really being energized. So yeah, I think all of those things are very confusing to people and I hope to clear up those. <laughs> like, I think you that definitely confusion. are. <laughs> definitely yeah. are. I have a question about like your definition because you have mm -hmm. your split definition. You also have mental and then your sacral connected everything. Yeah. Was it hard at the beginning when you first learned about that? Like, how do I, how do you discern how do you make space to balance your mental process, which is, you know, it's always going, it's going to be making sense yeah. of things. And then also like your body's cues. How do you personally align? How do you make space for both? Yeah, it's a constant like battle between those two voices. Anybody with split definition of any kind is going to have like, like two or more voices kind of going at any time in their body. And yeah, I think like I, I've, at least since I found human design, I haven't had a really hard time listening to my sacral. It's, it's there. I, I'm pretty attuned to it. But what can happen is that the analyzing, the thinking, the mental energy can just kind of take over and I can get really sucked into that. And a lot of shoulds and it still happens to me. Like it's something that's just always is going to kind of ha happen. But when you become more aware of it, like I can literally feel my energy like up in my head and then I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Like let's put that back down. Cause it's like, you know, the, I, I mean, I love my mind. I love thinking, I love analyzing, but that's not my decision maker. It's not how I decide where to put my energy. So when I feel myself thinking too much about like what I should be doing, that should is so key. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Put it back, like bring it back. Um, so yeah, it's like a constant like a constant adjustment yeah it's also part of being human I think you know our minds we're also so trained to rely on our minds so to be completely disconnected wouldn't make sense either so I love hearing about you know even the human experience of okay put it back how do you put it back <laughs> what are some things that works for you yeah usually I just have to take a break from whatever I'm doing. And because I am a very like mentally charged, mentally active person with that defined head in Ajna, which is not most people, uh, for me, it's almost like I have to involve my mind in the redirection of my energy. So for me, a lot of like sitting down, journaling, reflecting, being like, wait, what is actually feeling energizing right now? Not do what I think I should be doing, not what I think would be strategic or successful or whatever, because as a generator, that's not really what I'm designed to think of, to like go toward first and foremost, like for anything to work out for me, 
in the long term, I need to be doing something that just feels energizing, even if it doesn't really make sense. So yeah, I kind of allow my mind to be part of that because honestly, it's like, yeah, we can't ever let go of our minds. Our minds are how we perceive the world. Every, even every like stimuli in our body ultimately gets filtered through the mind, like in order to make a decision and take a step, our brain is literally sending a message out to our limbs to like move us forward. So yeah, it's not like we never, uh, or like we release the mind completely, but yeah, basically like just sitting back and being like, what actually felt energizing? Let's redirect to that Mm -hmm. is, is very helpful. I love that. Thank you for sharing more yeah. of it. <laughs> because I have so many questions, like the sacral experience, how does it feel? And I've also heard a lot of, you know, after we've done this work, it's like surrender, surrender. And I get it because I've experienced it, mm-hmm. but surrender for a generator, how does that look like to allow things to come to you to respond? And you've also shared a little bit about the generator plateau, the sacral plateau. I'm like, oh, that is fascinating because I've witnessed this in the generators in my life. Tell tell me a little bit more about what is a generator plateau. Yeah, the generator plateau is basically where you're kind of going along in whatever you're doing, you're building. We tend to take on things that are longer term, um, where we stick with the same thing for a certain amount of time. And at points, you'll just reach a point where it's like you're progressing, you're progressing, you're progressing. And then all of a sudden, you're just not progressing so much. And so you go through a period where really what you're doing is you're kind of saving up your energy for your next big development, your next response, the next thing that's going to take you in the right direction. Um, But it can feel really disorienting when it happens because you feel like, oh, all my energy has gone for that thing. Oh, I don't know where I'm going. Oh. And your mind really doesn't like that. It's just very uncomfortable. So I think when I started looking into human design or sharing about human design, I was like, oh yeah, it's all going to be about talking about the sacred response and feeling it in your body and all this stuff. Really the way that my work has gone in response to like everyone I talk to and my own experiences has been working more with the mind because that's like our number one enemy. The, the sacral operates on its own pretty well. It's really just the mind that gets involved. So learning about your sacral response and your human design, like the information is somewhat simple, but then putting it into practice and allowing that to show you and like kind of prove to you over time that it's like a trustworthy, uh, I guess, like thing to follow (laughs) that requires like really allowing your mind to take a step back and see that, okay, yeah. So I get into a plateau. So I'm not really making progress for a while. Well, every other time that's happened, I just had to be patient, not get myself worked up, not try to fix it. Like I, that, those are all the traps I've fallen into a million times is like, well, maybe if I do this, then I can just get over this, like make it all work. And it, it just never really works. So now when I hit those, it's like, okay, no, this is my time to just rest, be mm-hmm. really keep my mind in that open place of like looking for those opportunities and being aware of those responses so that I can take action on them. And then all of a sudden it's like, poof, you're like, skyrocketed to like your next uh development in whatever you're doing and yeah it doesn't it doesn't feel good <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to the mind but it just is I don't know it just, it's just it part just of the is. process yeah. yeah and I think that's also part of the work that you do you know that you shared about like subconscious programming which mm-hmm. is basically about like how do we hold ourselves in the midst of yes satisfaction success whatever's happening but then when things are not working when we hit that Mm -hmm. plateau when we hit that burnout when we hit our own conditioning it's like and can you talk a little bit more about it even though you've already explained it (laughs) what is subconscious programming yeah I really didn't talk about that and that's why like these other tools have become so helpful like I don't only talk or teach or offer things that are like human design information like I like to provide that as the base But then these other tools are what really help us put this into practice because the thing about generators and MGs is that we have, you could say we have kind of like the easiest inner authority to listen to 
but we are, I would say like as a group, the group that has the hardest time actually living our design. And Mm -hmm. if like, I mean, I will, I will definitely come into and like Ra Uruhu started human design. He would say this too, like you will meet generators and MGs who know all about their human design and they're still like not living it. Like it's very hard because your mind really fights you. So like I, I was kind of seeking the answer to that. Like, how do we, how do I help people with that? Because I saw a lot of people get that human design info, be like, okay, I kind of, I understand what my inner authority is, but then just not really make any progress. And honestly, I was having the same problem. Like there were just certain areas in my life where I was not making progress. And I was like, there has to be more to this because I was like, I am listening to my sacral, like a really high percentage of the time. And yet there are still these things that aren't quite working out for me. So that was when I got interested in subconscious reprogramming which really is like the way I see it, it's basically aligning your mind with your inner authority. So there's something that you're desiring, something that you want. It's it's kind, you know, you could almost call it manifestation. I don't use those that word anymore, but that's kind of what generators and MGs are doing all the time. It's like you're desiring something inside and then you're attracting things that help you make that an external reality. And when your mind has some kind of program in it from childhood, from whatever, that that is impossible. You're not looking for that. You don't even wouldn't even know when you see it, like you're trying to make more money. You're trying to get a new job. You're trying to find a really good partner, like all these things. You just won't even see the thing to respond to. (laughs) Like it just will be blocked from from your perception because we do ultimately perceive the world through our mind. That is like our lens on the world. So when we can align with that and like tell our mind, like, I can see this, this is true for me. Uh, This is possible for me. Then all of a sudden you're looking out in the world and you're like, oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Then you're like responding to all these things that you wouldn't have seen before. So that has like really changed my life for sure. And it's really resonated with my audience because I think a lot of other people were hitting those walls too. And that's when you kind of want to give up on maybe listening to your inner authority. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, I've been listening to all these responses and yet I'm not seeing like the results that I wanted. And I think the, like the next level to crack through is that subconscious reprogramming, that getting that mind alignment and then you really see results (laughs) oh gosh yeah I can even resonate with that as a projector and holding on to a version of success yeah feeling that I got there and then my beautiful mind sometimes with the stories of like worthiness of like how hard you should work and you know all those stories that we carry within us of how we see the world. But then when there's little ways to tweak it, like, okay, you want to bring more colors in your life, focus on a yellow umbrella. And then Mm -hmm. suddenly you see more yellow umbrellas Mm -hmm. and you see the opportunities. I love that. (laughs) It's crazy. Like, and I, I think even, you know, we, as generators, we do respond to things outside of us, but we also get ideas and things like, I will notice I'll be feeling blocked, like, oh, I don't know, like just, you know, all the, all the messages that come from my undefined centers, like all of them. (laughs) Oh, I don't think there's any value in anything I do. Oh, I don't, you know, whatever. And then I'll sit down and just spend like five minutes just thinking different thoughts. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, I was going to post that. I was going to do this. I was going to offer that. And then all of a sudden it's just like, things are going again. So it's crazy. It's just, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, which is the perfect way to kind of lead into like you, writing a book, how was the process? Because I've read your blog, I've heard your story as well of like how you really wanted to do it, but also knowing that the timing was important. The process was important. It wasn't just writing a book at any cost. (laughs) Yeah, I think like a long time ago, I kind of knew, and this is something that also is interesting with the the sacral response, even if you have emotional authority, like everyone ultimately starts with the the sacral response is like, I knew a long time ago that I would write a book, but that knowing is not my decision maker. You know, that would be more someone with a splenic authority when they, as soon as they are aware of something, as soon as they kind of know that thing, 
that's when they start to make a decision. But that is not true for me. That is not my decision-making authority. So I'll have awareness of all sorts of things way before it happens or way before I have the energy for it. Because that's ultimately what I'm waiting for is like, do I have the energy and is that next step like very clear to me? So I knew like a long time ago that I'd probably write a book. I didn't know exactly what or when. Um, and there were definitely points where I was like, well, should I just do this? And then I was like, no, I don't have any energy for this. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so I think I, at a certain point, I was kind of like, well, if I were to do this, like, how would I want it to be? And I just sort of tapped into like, what are, what are my desires? I was like, I would want to do it with a publisher. Um, I would just want, I would want someone else to be there to help me understand like what the market would want. Like those are, that's just something that is not natural for me as a one, three profile. I'm kind of in my own world and it's important for me to have other people who help me see like well this is what like the rest of the world <laughs> like yeah. could want from you <laughs> so I was like I definitely want help with those things and I was like and you know what I also want them to approach me like those were just I don't even know that those were super conscious thoughts I was having but it was like thoughts I, I had been having because I was like I don't want to go seeking for this that's not really correct for me I mean you can seek things but it kind of has to be in response so then, yeah, it was just like one day I got an email from someone, a publisher, and she was like an editor. She was like, hey, would you want to write a human design book? And I was like, yeah, like my, I had that response. I was like, yeah, I do. And of course, I had to I had to meet with her, make, feel it out, make sure it was the right fit, because that's the other thing is like the sacral is not all knowing. It's not an awareness center. It's not like the spleen where it kind of has this like information from somewhere that you don't really know where it came from it's not like that at all it truly only responds like what's in front of it so it's really important when you're making this a decision to expose your sacral to like all the facets of it so even though it was like a yes to I want to write a book it's like but do I want to write a book with this person is this the right project so I met her and it it felt like a good fit and it was just very like effortless from there we kind of just came up with the concept and um yeah got it approved by by like her team and then we went for it so that was a very generator way of having that happen of just like allowing that to come to me but I didn't get to decide when it happened or exactly how it happened like I didn't really have control over that but I just think like knowing that I wanted it to come to me and just being patient allowed right. that to happen so it was good <laughs> right right and also setting not the boundaries or limitations, but like, oh, I want this to happen. I want to write it with someone. I want an editor. I want whatever. I'm like, those are such honest and beautiful part of the process that sometimes people can judge themselves for like, oh my gosh, like, who am I to wait for something? Or like, shouldn't I try it that way? All conditioning. But I just love that you share that, like, be very honest, like, this is what I want. And let it come to you in the mm -hmm. process. And something that sparked, you know, that was fascinating because you said, even though the spleen, you know, they have more information, they know what they want, they can make more decisions. You also have a splenic definition, but it's not mm -hmm. directly connected to your sacral, right? So yeah. Yeah. How does that knowing still infuse your decision? Yeah. Yeah. I'll have a lot of knowing about things and it's, it's helpful. Like there's nothing bad about it, but then I just have to wait until I have like the actual response or the mm -hmm. energy. So it's kind of cool. Like I, I definitely feel like I have consistent, um, access to like my intuition. Like I, I can definitely know things or, um, like I, I used to do a lot of intuitive readings as part of my business. And I, I do really enjoy doing that. I don't do that now for whatever reason. I don't really know why I just it's not something that's energizing for me at the moment, but it was definitely something that I had consistent access to. Like if someone needed an answer to something, I could provide some kind of awareness. And I've talked to friends who have um, undefined spleens and they're just as like gifted in that area, but they're like, oh yeah, it tires me out. I couldn't show up and do that every day. So yeah, I, it's a, it's cool. I love having a defined spleen. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely separate from the, yeah. the mechanism that's telling me do like put your energy toward this or not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm like so many questions I want to ask as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you share a lot about also proactive response versus mm -hmm. the opposite of it. And I've seen also in my clients sometimes how the 
they're so exhausted. It's almost like they're responding to everything, even from the mind. Have you find that happening? Like, what does it mean that the response comes from the outside versus from a mental response, which it's a valid response sometimes. Yeah, I've gone back and forth on that because I definitely feel that I think especially, I don't know, a lot of us are connected to our intuition, to maybe our psychic, whatever. And to me, that is kind of a form of outside of us. It's like you're tapping into an idea or a message or something in sort of the collective consciousness. So I I don't see everything that comes into our, like, you know, our, our centers, our like head center um, as being like from us. Uh, so I do think you can respond to those things. I definitely have had responses to things that are inside of me. So I think it's more important not to draw that line because I think people do get really confused about that. Like, oh, I had this idea, but, and I responded to it, but does that mean that it's like the wrong thing? And I think that's where you just have to really know how your body feels when it's having a genuine response, because the, like the way that I like to tell if it's like a thought that I'm having that I'm responding to, that's just kind of inside of me or just some kind of like divine inspiration or whatever is if I have this thought, like if I do X, I will achieve Y. So that's why I should do it. Then I know that it's kind of like, no, 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 no. That's like inside of me. So it's like, oh yeah, I should do this because it mm-hmm. will get me this outcome because we're just generators and MGs. We're just not designed to be focused on the outcome. Outcomes are just like a natural byproduct of us honoring our energy. As long as our minds are aligned, um, mm-hmm. that is very important. So anytime I'm thinking too hard about like, oh, I can achieve this. It's like, no, 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 no. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Like, that's like the bad voice. Like, that's not, (laughs) that's not it because I will achieve that, but I have to kind of like put that to the side and just allow my sacral to like take me in that direction. So yeah, like if, if you're feeling a response to like something and you think maybe it's in your mind, if your body is feeling genuinely like energized by that, there's no harm in like trying it out yeah like if in the end you realize like okay yeah that wasn't really a response uh then you know maybe (laughs) in the future you don't do that but I'm a third line profile like I gotta try everything so and I I think humans humans are like that to an extent no matter what your profile is so there's no harm you you can't mess it up you know people get kind of precious with it thinking like if I don't do everything perfectly I'll mess it up it's like there's no messing it up like you just experimenting you're learning and you can just you can change course it's not a big deal (laughs) it's so true and thank you for you know definitely resonating with that because sometimes there is this fear of like I've learned about my human design now this is the goals I want to do and things are not working out then Mm -hmm. I'm doing it wrong and then it's kind of like perpetuates the cycle like oh and then also allowing to be like but can I just try can I play when we remember ourselves as kids and how we found joy it was never strategic it was never like I'm gonna go up the slide and come down and I'm gonna have the best time (laughs) no I think that is a hundred percent conditioned into us especially if like you were really into succeeding in school or you're an achiever of any kind I definitely was like that was very much a part of how I grew up. And so it can be really hard to release that, I, that thing of like wanting to do it perfectly or, or it's in most cases, it's completely subconscious, but we just feel somehow that we can't make that mistake because so many of us are taught, like, if you get this grade in school, your whole future is ruined. And it's just like, we just, that is like a deep conditioning that we receive. And that's just crazy. It's not true at all. Mm -hmm. With your business and the process of writing a book, like I'm sure there's been so many opportunities to (laughs) decondition. What were some of the biggest things that you've had to release when you started running your business of perhaps how it should look like or what generators should do, like all those little shoulds that come (laughs) as part of our process? Yeah, I mean, I'm like still dealing with that at every new chapter because things change over time. You want to do different things. I think like the first one I had to really decondition from was the idea of what I had to put out there to make money because I think I was interested in 
doing things that were a bit different from maybe, you know, it's like, if you're in the online business space, it's like coaching and sessions and readings and all of that. And I wasn't just never really that interested in that. And so I think at first I felt, oh, well, I'm going to have to do that to make money. And I've done a little bit of that here and there when I wanted to, when it felt energizing, but by and large, I've been able to have a successful business by mostly through like writing and audios and even like these little like PDF got like almost like mini books. And I didn't really see a lot of people doing things like that. And so I felt like, oh, I can never be successful doing that. But there were like whole years where that was a lot of how I made my money and it was fully successful. So I think that was the first thing was just freeing myself to realize that like, if I'm energized by it, like Mm -hmm. it will, I mean, not always I'm a third line, like not everything will be ultra successful, but in the grand scheme of everything I put out there, it will be successful. So that was kind of the first one. And yeah, now I think I I still deal, like I was talking about this with um, like my marketing coach consultant, like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, you know, I should, like, I should be more visible, this, this, that. And she's like, but like, really should you? Like it, if you just, if you enjoy writing and, and recording podcasts and sharing yourself that way, like do you need to be doing those things? It's like, oh no, no, I don't. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's like a constant. It's it's just that that should, those like, it's so easy. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been, I think I've just been consuming too much like Instagram information. Oh, and it just, it's, it's insidious. It gets in there. It gets into all those undefined. And I don't even have that many undefined centers, but it gets in there. Like even, you know, they say like, like, well, I, I have undefined um, heart, and uh, solar plexus and throat those are my only ones and theoretically the throat is like your least impactful one like it doesn't you know don't receive like as many messages through there it doesn't like take you over so much but I was realizing like those those like get me so bad like all of that conditioning that I take in my throat I get all those not self like voices that's like one of my worst ones so yeah it's just like letting go of those shoulds is a thing at like every junction of my business for sure yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) especially like taking on those voices like they're meant to take in voices but sometimes also recognizing like definitely being in a business online business it is so noisy like Mm -hmm. it's always been noisy but it's even more noisy with the promises of like make x figures put on more programs and it's so easy to just amplify that and sometimes with the transits or you know wherever I'm at I feel that oh my gosh maybe I should maybe I should start doing that and then I realize wait (laughs) I'm depleted and I'm trying to do this and it comes from a should it's like okay reset reset it's gonna take some time but also realizing okay this is something I've amplified in the collective and perhaps it can be data for, you know, I'm a four six. I'm like, it's something that's happening. You know, there's a yeah. lot of this individuality that people are being nudged towards, but also we're looking for sustainability and we're going to have to learn and trip to get there. <laughs> yeah, it's that show that that is always the biggest indicator of just something has taken you over. And I do think like now with just sort of like the TikTokification of the internet and like nothing against that because I do really like consuming that content sometimes, but you're consuming so much so quickly, like way quicker than it used to be even like a few years ago. So I've noticed that that really gets me and I'm having to adjust to that and just know like, oh, I'm just not in a place to like be letting any of that in right now because I need to like get rid of what, yeah, what is turning into a should. Mm -hmm yeah oh thank you so much for sharing that I have one more question yeah how does joy feel for you does it feel easy to surrender to your joy yeah I think at this stage it does I mean when I started all of this like I was so far removed from that feeling of just enjoying my life and enjoying what I was doing that it took a while to allow that back in. But honestly, now it's like, I'm just, you know, I mean, I have my ups and downs. I have my things that happen for sure. But by and large, I'm just really happy to wake up every day. Like I, there's stress and there's things, but most of that is pretty much caused by my mind and what I'm thinking about things. And yeah, it's like joy is just, it's a natural 
byproduct of living life as a generator. If you are listening to your inner authority and you're open to that coming into your life, it is just there. And now it's, it's kind of just like being creative and joyful is kind of just like my default state of being. And Mm -hmm. that is such a difference from when I started my deconditioning process. I just really had like so little of that in my life. So yeah, it's just kind of just allowing it. And then it, it kind of multiplies from there. And yeah, I I love that feeling. (laughs) I can feel it. Thank you for sharing your joy and all of human design. Where can people find you? What is the type of work and your offers right now? Yeah, you can find me at puregenerators.com, at puregenerators on Instagram and Twitter. Those are kind of the two main, I guess, social media places where I hang out. Um, But yeah, my site has everything. I have a blog. I have lots of free information. I have my podcast. I have links to everything I offer. Um, But my main thing right now is a, I guess it's a membership. It's a, um, you can join for either three or six months. It's called the glow up for generators and MGs. And that's where I share some kind of new information or answer to a question Um, every single week, like a couple of times a month, I share like a bigger uh, drop of like human design info. And then every week I sort of respond to people's questions that are in the community. And that's been really wonderful because we basically sort of co-create it of everyone in there, me responding to what they're going through, creating tools and things to help them. So that's where the most of my energy goes. And that's been really wonderful. Some version of that has been going for a year. So that's really great. And yeah, that's what, sort of my main place for generators and MGs. But yeah, I also share a lot of other things for free online on my socials and website. And if you want to learn more about human design, you can also grab a copy of her book. I'll link everything in the show notes. And I'm so grateful. Thank you for taking the time to share your journey, your process, your thoughts with me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Great energy here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect women, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.